Hi and welcome. My name is Ben Rappel. I'm from FKD Studio in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about architectural filmmaking. Are there any other ArcViz artists in the audience at all? Yeah, a few. Anyone else from Australia? Just Dave in the back. Well, that's about it. Hi, Dave. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, just a little bit about us as a studio and myself. Um, FKD, we've been together for about two and a half years. Um, myself and the other two directors have known each other for eight plus years and used to work together. Um, but we decided to kind of come together and, and create our own studio. Um, a studio with the kind of values that we wanted to see come through in ArcViz and something that, that we wanted to kind of push ourselves. Um, and I guess for me, it was, it was about being able to branch out. And I've been creating films for a long time. Um, but this was kind of my chance to create the sort of films that I wanted to create and create the films that we wanted to create as a studio. Um, we're very um, collaborative about the way we work. Everything that we do is kind of all done together. Um, I first started using Max as I was studying architecture at university. Um, and I found myself, by the time I finished my degree, I was pretty much using all Max. Um, I'd rush through my designs so I could start building in Max. And I kind of knew at this point that, that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and so I've followed it ever since. Um, I've worked as an architect before. I've worked as an Autodesk trainer before. Um, I've worked my way up uh, one of Australia's largest ArcViz studios. Um, worked on countless films and had a number of them shortlisted for CG Architect Awards, which is great. Never won, unfortunately, but that's, that's the breaks. Um, but I was also lucky enough to work on the Now and When project, which was for the 2010 Venice Biennale. Um, it was a project that was collaborated with a bunch of architects, uh, kind of Australia's best architects, who would come up with a vision for the future of Australia. Um, and then we took their designs and kind of put them into, into 3D stereoscopic VR animations. Um, and we were lucky enough to win an Imaginer Award for that, which was really cool. Um, so what I might do before we go too much further, we'll show you a little bit about what we do, um, starting off with our showreel. So that's, that's kind of the culmination of a couple of years' work that we've, we've done together as a studio. Um, we put that together in the last couple of months. 
So today, what, what I'm going to go through with you is the kind of ins and outs of creating architectural films. Um, we'll look at kind of planning and, and selling the idea um, and making a vision a reality, um, looking at camera creation techniques, uh, the importance and the use of the audio in our films, um, how you can enhance your films through post-production, and bring it all together through, through editing. I hope from this that you guys will walk away from it understanding my process when it comes to making films, because everyone's got their own process, and I hope you can kind of use that to develop your own process in the future. So, how do you get into making architectural films? Well, for me, it wasn't really something that I'd set out to get into. Um, my love is for architecture, even though I wasn't a practicing architect. Um, I've always loved architecture, and that's why I studied it. But what I found is that I actually love the form of arch architecture um, more than the actual process. So, I then wanted to start to portray this on screen. And, and after I did this for a while, I just knew that this, this was really my passion. So, what's the point of making architectural films? Um, I guess there's a, there's a couple of th ways that you can consider it. Um, first of all is to explain the space. Um, and we do this, well, in the past we've done this with the dreaded term of fly-through, which we all hate. Um, we've moved on from this. We've moved on from the idea of, of just having to fly around the space and, and create something that is just about exploration. Um, I think that still has a point. A lot of architects still use that um, if they're trying to explain kind of um, difficult spaces. But I think that, that fly-throughs are going to kind of fall away um, in the future, and it's going to get taken over more by VR. Because VR, you're kind of creating your own fly-through. You can navigate the space yourself. Um, what's the point of being on a rail when you can just go and navigate yourself? So for me, fly-throughs are kind of a dead term. Um, and it's something that we, as an industry, really want to kind of break from. Um, a lot of people are still uneducated about it. So we always, whenever we get asked to do a film, they always come through and say, can you do a fly-through as well? Um, and we always find ourselves having to kind of explain that, well, that's, that's not really what you want. Um, because what, what we're trying to do, if you've already, got, you've already got other ways to explain the space, like if you've got a project, you're going to have images, you're going to have floor plans, you're going to have models, you're going to have sales agents explaining all the space. So if all of this has been done already, well, what's, what's the point of the films? Well, the point of the films for me is to drag the audience in and to try and get people to want to know more about the project. So we're basically trying to sell the dream. Um, as I said, we're part of a larger, larger marketing plan, so we don't really need to, to sell it too much. What we're trying to do is just get people excited um, and get them to want to come into the display suite or get them to want to find out more. Um, that's what it's all about. So, yes, we explain the space, but we don't need to explain all the space. All we want to do is kind of take those best bits of the project, bring them together into something that looks cool and sounds cool and makes people want to come and know more about your project. So I, I try and think of architectural films more as movie trailers. So we're kind of creating the trailer for our project. Um, and the two actually, the two actually sit, sit together quite well. Um, obviously, like if you take a movie trailer, you're taking the best parts of the film without actually explaining the whole film. You're not giving away the ending. Um, you're just doing something to drag people in. And that's what we're trying to do with architectural films. We just want to drag people in. Films used to kind of be quite long and laboured and more closely aligned with fly-throughs. Um, where they used to be kind of, I remember doing ones that were six to seven minutes long, had massive voiceovers, lots of maps, explaining all the spaces. Um, and people just kind of, towards the end of it, just kind of trailed off and, and weren't interested. And so that, that kind of loses the point of, of making these. If, if people are tuning out halfway through, what's the point in showing it all? So luckily, in the, last, in the last few years, there's kind of been a bit of a shift. And, and films have gone down a lot. Um, and they're kind of now towards the two to three minute mark. And I think this is kind of the attention span that people have when they're watching these things. And for me, the shorter you can make it, the, the better it's going to be. If you can tell a story in two minutes, and you can tell that same story in three minutes, we've just kind of got a minute's worth of padding in there. So I find it much better to, to create something that's short and sharp and is going to keep people engaged 
than to drag it out. This is also going to save on render time, which means that you can take those extra, say, minute worth of frame that, frames that you were going to render, take that frame time out, and boost your other frames. So you can render them higher quality, you can add more into your scenes, and you can kind of put that, put that emphasis elsewhere. Um, so yeah, for me, it's always about making it short and sharp. So what we're going to go into first is kind of how to, let's see if I can get this back. So the importance of planning your project out. So if you've got a project, you need to come, I mean, first you need to come up with an idea, but, but where do you start? Where does the idea come from? What's your inspiration? What's your motivation for it? Where do you start? Well, the first thing you need to do is kind of understand your project as a whole. If it's a large project, you're likely going to have a big marketing team on it. There's likely already a brand being developed that's been developed before you've come on board. Do you know where your film's going to be displayed? Is it just going to be on a website? Is it going to be a teasers for social media? Um, or is it going to be in, in a display suite? These are all things that can help you understand where to start with your project. So the first thing I like to do when coming up with an idea is, is understand the brand itself, understand the brand of your project. Because as I said, this is something that is likely going to be made up before you come into the project. And you kind of need to be a part of it. As I said, we're, we're part of an, a much bigger thing. It's not just all about the film. The film is one part of the collateral for this project. So for me, you need to be involved in it and you need to reference everything that's going on. There's no point in going off and doing your own thing and making something amazing, but then it doesn't sit with your project and then your client's probably going to be annoyed because they're going, well, what has this got to do with me? So you need to kind of fit within, within everything else that's happening. Um, the project that I'm going to go into shortly is, is a kind of a good example of this. Um, the project had a really strong brand identity. Uh, and our job was, was just to take these elements and kind of bring them into, into our film and bring them to life on the screen. So the first thing I did was talk with the architects, talk with the brand designers and find out their motivation. So the architects, the architects had a, this big um, emphasis on this, on this brand pattern that was created by the branding agency. The architects took that brand pattern and they put it all through their architecture. They had it in metal screens, they had it in lattice work, they had it in wall panels, um, it was kind of all through. The branding agency had it obviously all through their print collateral, um, but they also had it in the display suite, on the websites, it was basically everywhere. So I knew that well, this is the thing that was going to link our film together, and this is what we needed to be our hook. So what we did was we brought that same brand pattern into our film in different ways. We, we used it in transition overlays. Um, we used it in focusing it on the frame. Um, and we also used it in, in things like shadows on the ground. So it's all throughout the film. It's not always in your face, um, but it's always there. So that when people are watching it, they should draw back to the fact that it's part of this bigger picture. And that was, that was what we hoped to achieve. And, and that's what I think we set out to do. But if you don't have a good hook to start with, well, how do you start? Um, as I said before, it's great to, to be as creative as we want, but as I said, we need to be a part of a bigger picture. So I always say that you should collaborate with others. As a studio, we're always collaborating together, so I'm not just making a film independent from everyone else. We're making it together as a studio. But as your project, you should consider everyone a part of your studio in this case. You want everyone to be involved in it. And if you get people involved in it at the start, they're more likely to be receptive to your ideas because they feel like they've made some sort of impact into it. Even if they haven't really, they've still been involved in the process. And this is just going to make your job easier in the long run. So you've come up with an idea. Next thing you need to do is, is kind of get that idea down on paper. Um, and, and in that way, we start to create our script. So the architectural script is, is a bit different to your kind of film or TV script. 
Um, it's more of a, I guess, a synopsis of your film as a whole. So obviously we don't have characters that need um, voice lines and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite different. It's more of a synopsis. Um, so I start this process by just jotting down some notes, some ideas that might pop into my head for it. And generally one idea will then spawn another and spawn another. That last idea might inform the first one, which was wrong, and then I'll change that. So I try and keep this quite a fluid process um, because you're likely going to have to come up with a few ideas before you get something across that, that your client's going to like. So keep it short and keep it sharp um, and it just make it a little bit easier down the track. So if you've got your idea and you've got it, you've got it signed off, um, you need to kind of put that into a presentable script. So something that people can read through and, and understand what you're, what you're going to create. Um, if you've had a chance to look through the class handout, there is a, a sample script that we've got. I do have it on here, but it's really hard to read. Um, so hopefully you've got that. Otherwise, I'll read through part of this as, as we're going. I'm going to kind of break, it, break down how we come up with these scripts. So what you can see across the top, I don't know if that works, no, that doesn't work. Um, so the first thing we've got is our overview. This is basically a quick synopsis of your film. It's something that people can kind of read in, in 10 to 15 seconds and get an idea of, of what your film's going to be. Some people that you're going to be presenting to, this is likely all that they're going to read of, of what you've got. So keep it short and sharp and, and make sure you're kind of getting all those main points across that you want to get. Then I break it down into a number of columns. So I've got through here, I've got title, I've got vision, and I've got description. So title is basically just sectioning up your film, creating chapters for your film. Obviously, at the end of the day, your film needs to be a cohesive film. You shouldn't see these sections come through. But the point of putting them down in this time is, is to make sure that you're covering off everything that you need to cover. And this will also help those people that you're selling it to. The next one we've got is vision. This is basically just what you're going to see on the screen. Um, the different points. So as you can see, I've kind of broken it down into 3D and film. The reason I like to do this is because you've got your, your 3D guys that are making your content for you. You've got your film guys that are going out and shooting stuff for you. If you can let them know what it is they're going to see on the screen, it's going to make that job easier for them in the future. Um, and then we've got a description. This is just your descriptive way of um, writing down what's, what's in each section. Here you can put things like interesting transition techniques you might have come up with, or just some ideas of how you might want, want it to look. Um, and then the last one, which I don't actually have on here, um, it's audio. The reason I don't have it is because other, our other director, Nick, who's not here today, is, is actually our music producer, so he does everything in-house. So we're lucky enough to be able to bounce ideas off each other all the time and come up with our audio and edit together. Um, but if you don't have that luxury and you're employing a music producer, you kind of need to give them an idea of, of what you're thinking. Because they're going to kind of draw, they need to draw from you and you need to kind of play off with them. So if you can, if you can create an audio section, you're kind of describing things like the ebb and flow of the film. If you, if you want a quieter section or a louder section or you want it to crescendo, you want the beat to change, write those things in there. So they've got an idea of, of where they can kind of start and they can come back with a response to you. Um, so as I said, I don't include it in here just because we, that's the way we work, but it's a great thing to do if, if you don't have that on board. So the thing that goes hand in hand with the script is the storyboard. Um, it's basically a visual representation of your script. The audience should be able to refer back to both. You're going to have people that are more comfortable with words and others that are more comfortable with pictures. So if you can have both of them there and they can relate to each other, um, then it's just it's easier for everyone to understand it. Um, if you are doing it this way, what you need to do, and we'll go to our sample storyboard, you want to keep everything the same. So. I've got my sections the same, um, the order's the same. People should just be able to read through these frames um, and understand and read back to that script and make sure that they're in line with each other. 
Um, the other thing that I do, as you can see underneath it, we've kind of got these section lines. So this is what's breaking up those different sections that you've come up with. Um, and the reason I kind of do this is, is to indicate timing. So rather than saying the intro is going to be 30 seconds long, the amenities is going to be a minute long, I just do it in terms of frames. So something that's got four frames is obviously going to be a lot shorter than something that's got, say, 15 frames. But doing it this way, you, you make it easier on yourself because you're not going to get bogged down in numbers. Um, and your client's not going to get bogged down in numbers. If they see, well, my intro was supposed to be 30 seconds, but it's only 10 seconds, where's the rest of my intro? Well, you realize that it didn't need that long, so you've made it shorter. But that doesn't mean that they'll understand that. So I find it better to do it this way. You're not as tied down. You've never seen it on screen yet, so you don't know if that timing is correct. It's better just to wait it this way. So this one had three pages of storyboard. Um, and what I'm going to do is just quickly read through a couple of these descriptions of the script and how that relates to the storyboard. So if we look at the laneway culture section, what I've written here is feature the desirability of the atrium area with both wide format and showing, showing the scope, to show off the scope of the space, and in closer detail to show the beauty of materiality and light through the space. Close-ups on the ground as sun time lapses through. Look up through the lattice work with the sun flaring towards us. To bring the area to life, we intercut atrium space with film of South Yarra culture, cafes, fashion, use of talent to bring human element into the space. Talent riding push bikes, walking Chapel Street, Turak Road, sitting at cafes, etc. So really, what we should be able to do is look at that. You can see in the amenities section, we've got We've got the atrium space in close up and, uh, and mac uh, sorry, macro and micro. We've got the people cut in and interspersed through those, so it's giving it a bit more life. Um, we've got the bike riders, we've got the cafe culture, we've got the fashion. So it's, it's just making sure that those elements are in there. The stuff that you've written down is up on screen as well. So definitely have a look through in the handout. I don't want to go through it all, otherwise we'll be here all day. Um, have a look in the handout. Have a look on our Vimeo page. Um, that's got the final film. And you'll kind of see that the script storyboard and final film are actually quite close to each other. So what we'll do is have a look at how this one turned out.
that, so that was, that was our project Yarrowine. We did that um, towards the, was it the end of last year? Yeah, end of last year. Um, so if you do get a chance to kind of read through it all and then rewatch the film, you'll notice that it's, it's pretty similar. There are some, some differences because, you know, there's ideas that we had at the start that just didn't get to the end. You know, we wanted to add some talent into some of the key areas, but there's just no budget for it. So, so things like that kind of fall away. Um, and you need to kind of have that flexibility. But just make sure if you are doing it, don't say that we're definitely going to have talent in this section or we're definitely going to do, do this. Do, you know, we'd like to have something in there, budget permitting or, you know, creative direction permitting and stuff. Um, because, yeah, you need to keep flexible with it. So, oh, I need to get back to this, sorry. So we've got, we've got it signed off. Um, the next thing you need to kind of do is, is start to create your animatics. Um, and we kind of go through a few different versions of animatics. The first one we start with is, is what we call a storyboard animatic. This is where you literally just lay out your storyboard images um, to work out your overall timings for your different sections. Um, at this point, you want to kind of keep your audio fairly, fairly loose. Um, if you've got someone that you're working with, it's almost better to get kind of chunks of audio from them that you can then go and dumbly edit into your um, animation. Uh, and then that way you can kind of inform your sections and work out, you know, which, which sections you need to see for how long. Um, you can then just give that back to your music guy and they can tidy it all up for you. Um, but it's this kind of back and forth working that you need to have happening at this point. Um, this is generally just an in-house tool. Um, I wouldn't show this to people that you're not working with. What we use it for is just to kind of start to generate some ideas of how we want this film to come out. Um, if you start to show this to people outside, they're probably going to sit there, they're going to get bored by it because it's literally just images on the screen with some dodgy audio behind it. Um, and they may just start to kind of question what, what you're trying to do. So I'm going to show you an example of that from another project that we did. I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing because you want to claw your eyes out by the end of it. Uh, except that has no audio. Let's try that one. So in this case, I have actually gone and added um, timings to it. But again, that's because we're just using this in-house. No one outside of, of our studio is going to see it. Um, so it doesn't really matter. What we're just trying to do here is just say, well, this is roughly what we're looking at. The audio at this point is, is very bare bones. Um, what you'll hear as this goes through and we, and we see the final film. Um, it's pretty close to this but it's been added upon as we go through. There's a section through here where this one section just labors on and on and on. That's because we've just taken it and just edited it across because we knew that was what our timing was for. So what we've done, we did actually create the full thing for this. Um, and this was just so we knew, well, how long do we need for our interiors? How long do we need for our intro? How long do we need to show the building for? So we just kind of get this idea of timing. Um, and once we do that and we're happy with it, we start to then move on to what we call the presentation animatic. This is your kind of main animatic that you're going to be working through um, as you're creating your film. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be more and more refined through your process. So at the start, it's going to start off as your storyboard animatic, and what you're going to do is start to get rid of those storyboard elements and start to bring in the animated sequences that you have. So whether it be your animated cameras or or your film, depending on when they come in, when you get them, you start to kind of overlay them, and then this will again start to just re refine those timings even more. Um, what I like to do though when I do um, 
the presentation animatics and moving forward is make sure I'm always still rendering my scenes. So a lot of people will just use wireframes to get an idea of their timing. Um, while this is fine, you can see the motion, you, you're not kind of getting the emotion and the mood out of the scenes because lighting plays such a big part and, and materiality plays a big part. So I find it better just to, to render everything super low res. I try and keep everything kind of under a minute of frame so I can just bash out as many cameras as I need to do and get them back quickly. Um, it's just, it's better and, and it's gonna be easier for you to kind of explain your film. If you have a, a full animation with worth of wireframes and you show that off to people, they're not really gonna understand it. People that don't do ArcViz or aren't, aren't um, up to speed with CAD and stuff are really not very good at reading wireframe. Um, so yeah, so what I'll do, I'll now show you the presentation animatic. This one, we kind of went through, at this point, we went through two of these, depending on you know, how many times you need to show it off to your client or, or how much kind of iteration you've got along the way it will depend on how many of these you create. In this case, it was two. And what I'm gonna show you is the final one that we got sign off on, so we could then go to full production. So at this point, we'd, we'd got some of our film footage um, and we just kind of mucked around with a couple of colours and things like that, but it's a bit, it's all over the place. Some of them are in colour, some of them are black and white. We're still kind of trying to work that out. super low res frames that are being rendered out. These will render out really fast and you can dump them back into your edit really quickly. This space hadn't been done yet so it's still in, sto in storyboard. And these areas had been rendered out a little bit more but they still needed work. So as I said, that's, that's what we got sign off on for this. Um, we'll have a look at the final film. Um, there really wasn't much of a difference between the two. Uh, a couple of scenes changed. Again, the audio was still being worked on um, and the audio for us gets worked on through the whole process. It's not until right at the very end that everything kind of comes together. Um, so we'll show you the final one. And you'll see where it all ended up.
can see that it's, it's pretty well aligned with the, with the animatic. Um, everything is just kind of tightened up. Um, all the color correction and stuff was on there. And um, yeah, that's where we ended up. So oh, I keep forgetting to go back to this PowerPoint. Right. So we've had a look at kind of the process of making it from, from start to finish. Um, I guess what I want to have a look at now is, is the key components that I think go into making these films. Um, and for me, one of the most important things is camera composition. Um, I think it's as important as film as it is in stills. Um, and, and the three of us actually come from, when we started out, we came from a studio that was closely aligned with um, John Gollings, who's one of Australia's kind of premier architectural photographers. And, and this is this experience that kind of um, led us on and, and really made us focus on composition. It made me focus on composition. Um, and I think it's almost more important to have a well-composed shot than it is to create movement. So what you'll see in a lot of my shots is there's not a huge amount of movement to them, I'm not jumping around from space to space. Everything is quite linear and, and soft. And it's because I place such a big emphasis on composition that, that I do it this way. Um, so in terms of composition, I mean, there's a lot out there on the web. It's worth having a look at. We're going to go through some of the main ones that I like to focus on. Um, but there's a huge amount out there. If you're interested in filmmaking, not just architectural filmmaking, but filmmaking in general, go and search these out because they're a great way to kind of come up with ideas. Um, I don't always kind of rely on these to create my cameras, but I'm always kind of thinking of them in the back of my mind. And I always come back to these techniques when I kind of run dry on ideas. If I can't come up with something, I'll stick an overlay over my screen and try and create some cameras based on some composition techniques. Um, and this helps me come up with different cameras. So let's have a look at the main ones that I kind of look through. So the first one is the rule of thirds. It's a pretty common one. Um, you just divide your screen into, into nine equal panels with two equally spaced vertical and horizontal lines. Um, and then you place key compositional elements um, along these lines or on these intersections. So if you look at the top example, um, we've got the bench line is sitting in that bottom third, uh, that bottom third line. I've also gone, and while it's not creating them on the line, if you look at those two lights in the top, they're both center placed in, in the top left and top middle quadrant. If you look at the bottom one, you draw, you draw across that top horizontal line, you'll see the sun sitting across there. The left vertical line is where that pergola is kind of touching. And the bottom right hand cross is where we've kind of set the focus, which is our, our fireplace. So the, this is something that I'm always looking at. Um, and it's generally something that I'll have on my screen. The next we've got is leading lines. Um, these are diagonal lines that are used to kind of draw your viewer's attention to specific parts of your frame, whether it's a vanishing point, whether you're drawing a line to a subject. We've got framing. So this framing is basically using objects in your scene to kind of frame your focus. So in the, in the top example here, we've got a chair kind of framing off the, the bottom right hand corner. Obviously your focus is through to the couch at the back. Um, and the bottom one, it's, it's using a tree to kind of, to frame off that building behind it. And, and in here, what I like about this is that juxtaposition between the, the really geometric lines of the building with the real soft um, canopy of the tree. We've then got patterns and repetition. Um, people are drawn to patterns, um, and it can be a great way to make otherwise mundane looking spaces actually quite interesting. So all this, all this top one is, is just um, these quite nice tiles that they put in a bathroom. Um, and we just ran the camera across these tiles and broke that up with the tap. So if you break up repetition, it can often be a really strong element. So you can just have just have the tiles running across, break that up with something like a tap, and it kind of creates something a bit more unexpected, and it draws people in. And we've got symmetry. So people generally find symmetrical objects more beautiful, um, and it can make architecture really powerful. These buildings, in this case, are not the most attractive buildings in the world, but if you're looking up a gun barrel between these two buildings, it's a really powerful shot. Same with looking dead straight on this building. It's really rigid, it's strong, um, and it just kind of draws you in. 
So I'm going to go through and show you in a minute some of, the, some of these techniques in use in our films. Um, but first I want to kind of go into adding animation to your objects. So as I said, because our, because our scenes are, are quite linear and they're quite soft and slow, you need to add animation somewhere. You need to add some motion somewhere. So I prefer to kind of do that in the scene. So adding things like time-lapse light, which you saw a lot of in the Yara 1 film, it adds motion. So you don't need to move your camera at all, if any. Um, and this light movement is actually doing, doing the motion for you. Same with time-lapse time -lapse skies. You can have a beautiful composition of your building set up and have that motion of the sky running past. You can use natural elements like the wind to create animation. And these are really good. So the wind can be used in a number of ways. You can have it um, blow the curtains into a room. What this will do is make a space feel open and airy and inviting. Um, you can have the trees animating in the wind. If you do do this though, be careful. I've seen a, a number of films that people have done recently where all the trees are blowing around like crazy and it just looks like you're sitting in a wind tunnel. So you need to be a little bit kind of restrained when you're doing this, this sort of film. Um, don't make everything go crazy. Just remember, you just need that little bit of background motion to make it feel like you're not sitting in a freeze-framed world. Um, or you can have something like leaves blowing on the ground. So if you've got a, a panning shot going across that's quite slow and these, these leaves blow across the ground in the opposite direction, you're kind of creating the movement that way and that's drawing people's attention. If you don't have the budget to do a lot of this stuff in 3D. There's a lot of animation that you can do in, in post. Um, you can do things like adding the time-lapse guys, adding dust, adding lens flares, um, 2D animated birds going across the scene. Things like that can bring life to you without actually costing you a lot of money. Um, but just try and be careful and use things where, they, where you feel they should go. Like you don't want to have an interior scene and have all this dust flying through because it's just going to make your scene feel like it's dusty and dirty and old. But if you had it sat in an, a beautiful, nice park shot, you're sitting low near the grass, you're looking up at the bushes, and there's these little dust motes flying around, it's kind of giving a bit of life there. You can imagine them being the little insects that fly around in the grass or, or just some, some slight dirt kind of flying across the scene. It, it has a place there. So you need to, you need to kind of pick your place, where to, where to put this animation. As I said, you don't want to go overboard. You just want something there to make it look interesting. So we'll have a look at a bit of our camera composition breakdown. Um, and in that, you'll notice how we've kind of used animated objects to combat that. So that's, that's just some examples of how we've used it through our films. Um, I said they're, they're not always going to work for you. Like the rule of thirds is, is great when you set up a composition, then you start moving and obviously that gets broken. But it's a good starting point. You don't need to kind of stick to it religiously, but it's nice to kind of have there to, to think about. So that brings us to our next bit, which is how do you get inspired to make cameras? What is your inspiration? <coughs> For me, I like to draw a lot of comparison to, to film and TV and, and pick up ideas from there. I'm guessing most people would have seen Breaking Bad here, and if you haven't, then go and watch it. Um, the way that they, apart from being a great story, like their camera composition and the way that they dealt with light and color in that, in that show was just amazing. Um, 
And it's, it's looking at things like this that, that are a great way for you to kind of come up with ideas for yourself. Um, other things like the, the new Blade Runner, if you've seen that, the way that they use time-lapse sun through, place, through spaces to kind of create movement in architecture is amazing. Um, Aeon Flux from 2005, if everyone's seen that, for, I think Charlize Theron was in it. Um, the film was not great, but the architecture in that is one of the best architectural films I've seen. Like the way that they use their set design was just amazing and it was great to watch just for that. If you haven't seen it and you're into architecture, I'd, I would watch that. But work out, I mean, work out what you like. I mean, for me, I like real world cameras. So I set my, I set my cameras up as though it's in the real world. So dollies, zooms, pans, lifts, all these sort of things are kind of my staple camera. But obviously, if you just have slow motion the whole time, it, it can get a little bit boring. So it's good to go and look for more interesting techniques to go along with them and to break this kind of pattern up. So things that I like to try and play with, the trombone zoom or the dolly zoom is a great one. It's a really hard one to pull off in architecture. Uh, does anyone not know where the dolly zoom is? No, cool, that's good. Um, it can obviously make, it can make people feel a bit unsettled. Um, so use in architecture is quite, you need to be quite minimal with it. Um, but using it as a kind of secondary motion can be a nice way to kind of create something unexpected. So you could be having a lift coming up your scene, but this slight change in perspective can make people kind of really think about what they're watching. Um, the other camera that I really like to use is what I call the gravity camera. And all that is, is a dolly back through the space and a rotation on, it, on its local z-axis. What this does is kind of creates this sense of weightlessness and freedom in space. So while you might not have the biggest space, this sense of freedom kind of makes it feel more open and kind of larger than it is. Um, as I said, I think it's a great way to use to kind of break up your more traditional camera techniques. But what I would suggest is just find out what you like. Like your inspiration should come from what you like. I create these in the way that I create them because that's what I like to do. And if you guys can do that as well, if you can develop your own techniques, then just develop them from, from what you find and just create your own style. There's a kind of fine line between you know, referencing something and plagiarizing something. I mean, if you look at Alex Roman's Third and the Seventh, which I'm sure everyone's seen, well, everyone that's interested in has seen, um, it's still one of the best architectural films around, and it kind of spawned a genre of these more compositional um, kind of film styles. And I've seen studios themselves trying to replicate it, but not spending the time and not giving it kind of the, the praise that it deserves and, and kind of doing the original film a disservice and creating kind of an inferior product. So as I said, there's this fine line between kind of inspiration and plagiarism. Um, so be inspired by stuff, but just remember that you want to make something that's your own. You don't want to make something that's a copy of someone else's. There's no fun in that. Um, and people generally won't like it either. So we're now going to jump into editing and audio. So initially I was going to have the two of these separated, but to me, the edit and the audio go hand in hand. Um, as you'll notice with a couple of films that you've seen, I like to time everything to the music. Um, I just feel that the two together are stronger um, and they tell a stronger story. But that doesn't mean that's what you need to do. I mean, what you can do is it can still be just as powerful with the two separated from each other. Um, it's just for me, it's just a personal style. Um, you can do things like having it in time, taking it out of time, bringing it back into time to kind of create, again, create these unexpected moments between um, between the two in your film. So audio-wise, though, you've kind of got two choices. You can either get custom audio created. As I said, luckily, we have Nick in the studio that makes it all for us, which makes it kind of cheap and easy for us to, to do it together. Um, if you're then outsourcing your audio, though, it can obviously be a bit more expensive this way. So that's the con. But the pro is you're going to get a unique piece of audio that's going to be for your film and your film only. And it's going to be something that you can work with to, you know, to work to the ebbs and the flows of your film. Um, 
but as I said, it comes at a cost, and that's the price of it. If you don't have this luxury, though, there are some great stock audio sites out there that you can use. Um, I've made films with them before. You buy a couple of them for a few hundred bucks, edit it together yourself, um, and it works well. As I said, you're not going to have that, that same correlation between the two, um, but it's definitely better than not using any audio at all. Um, and just still staying on audio, the, to me, the audio style can really drastically change what a film is going to look like. So for Yarra 1, so we obviously pitched the idea, pitched the, the audio that's in the final film, but we also had a jazzy track, we had a kind of contemporary piano track, something that was a bit electro. We had kind of four or five options that we showed them. And it was this one that they went with. And to me, this is what's kind of dictated the final pace of the film. Obviously, that, that film wouldn't kind of work as well if it was jazzy and upbeat, or it might not work as well if it's got this contemporary house music behind it. I, I think that if I was editing that film to something else, it would look completely different to the way it looks today. So to me, the two are really interlinked and should be interlinked, and you should kind of work together. Again, it's all about collaboration for me and for us. The last thing that we're going to talk about is post-production. Um, post-production is the thing that ties your whole film together. If you can afford to have you know, a separate color grader, that's great. They can be expensive. But you don't necessarily need it. You can do all your color grading in-house. Um, we do all of our stuff in-house. Um, but the reason that you do it is because you, you want everything to sit within that same kind of color space. There's nothing more jarring than going from, I know this is an extreme example, but if your whole film is shot at night and there's this one daytime shot stuck in the middle of it, well, it's just out of place. The same can be true for just, I mean, just normal scenes. If you have these beautiful blue sky scenes, then you've got this really dark interior, well, they don't kind of sit together. So what you want to do is use your color grading and, I mean, use the use the way that you layer, layer your um, scenes together to kind of make them sit together. If you've got two things that are, that are juxtaposed, if you've got a day and a night, use a transition scene between them. Use something that kind of quickly time lapses from day to night, something like that, that will, that will make the, the two kind of sit back together. And I think you should always think of your 3D footage and your live footage together as well. The same, they should be color graded together. Um, ideally, what we want to try and show is that we've got this one cohesive scene or one cohesive film that some people aren't going to be able to tell what's 3D and what's real. So you obviously want them to sit the same next to each other. So what I've got here um, is just a little, a quick breakdown on, on how I kind of set up my post files. I do all my post work in After Effects. Um, I know there's plenty of other stuff out there. It's just this is what I've learned over time, um, and that's what I've stuck with. But what I'd say, and it, and it rings true to any program, even rings true back to, back to Max, is, is try and keep everything layered and ordered in a way that you're going to be able to find it. Name your files, name your layers, color your layers, do all these things. So if you come back to it at some point, um, you're going to be able to say, well, this scene is definitely, this part is definitely in effect because it's red. Um, it's also called motion blur. So try and keep it that way so that it will be easy. Because, I mean, you're not going to be, you may not be the person that's doing the 3D, the post work, the editing, the everything. So you're going to have other people that you're working with. Um, so it makes it easier if you can kind of work to a structure um, that everyone's going to be able to understand. So when it comes to post-production, I'm a strong believer in using plugins to benefit you. Um, don't be afraid of them. Some people kind of sit there and go, well, it's cheating because you're using a plugin. Well, it's not cheating because you're trying to create the best result that you can with the least amount of effort that you need. I mean, I'll take Re Real Smart Motion Blur as an example. After Effects has got its own motion blur in there, but it's slow and it just takes ages and it's not as good. Real Smart, I can dump it in there, my motion blur's done, I can move on. Same goes with, with Magic Bullet. Um, Magic Bullet is a great tool for um, color grading. You can get kind of stuck in the stigma of creating a Magic Bullet film if you just drag the looks on top of each other. 
Um, but it has a lot of great tools in there that you can use to add little bits of elements. It's got your levels, it's got your exposures, it's got chromatic aberration if that's what you want to add. All these little tools are great and they're a great way to be able to quickly and effectively kind of color grade your scenes. You can then drop them from one scene into another. Um, optical flares is what I use for my lens flares from Video Copilot. It's really cheap and it's a great way to add lens flares so you don't see that same Photoshop lens flare that everyone seems to use. Um, depth of field. So depth of field we use a lot in our scenes. Uh, we use um, software called Frischloft for that. Um, it creates kind of bokeh depth of field really well. Um, again, it's something that you can do in After Effects, but it's just not very good. Um, so I'd prefer to get, pay that a little bit of money um, and get that software that's gonna do it for us. And the last one I use a lot is, is Twixter, which is used for ultra slow-mo stuff. Uh, we used that on the Obsidian film that you saw earlier. Um, because unfortunately for that, they didn't have the budget for a high-speed camera and they wanted all, all the talent to be in slow motion. Um, so we were able to twist her down from, say, 25 frames a second um, down to like 150 frames a second. Um, and it was great. There was no tearing, there was no nothing. Um, Twixter is great for film, but 3D it still kind of struggles with a little bit. Mainly because you've got, your lines are kind of too sharp and it doesn't really know how to handle them all the time. So you get some tearing in that. But for film, it's great. Um, I know we're running out of time, so just quickly, the last kind of thing that I wanted to look at was the, the render elements that I use. Um, these are great ways to kind of add those little bit of extra details back to your scene. Things like lighting, reflection, refraction passes can be used to add more stuff. So you want to boost your lighting, add your lighting pass. You want your stuff to be more reflected, reflective, add your reflection pass. Obviously use your Z depth pass to create your depth of field. Um, and multi-mat, if anyone's used a multi-mat pass before, it splits, it splits objects into red, green, or blue channels, um, which can be easily matted out in post programs. Um, and this is what we kind of use it as, as like a mask that you might do in Photoshop. So what I'll do and what I'll kind of leave you with is a breakdown of the post-production from some of our scenes. So you can see how we layer them up. What I try and do is keep things rendered as close to the final result as you can. Um, but obviously everything kind of needs enhancement. So some of these will only have a few layers on them. Some of them are quite um, heavy though. So that, that's a bit of a breakdown. Now, that breakdown and the compositional breakdown will be up on our Vimeo site when we get back to Australia. Um, the animatic stuff will not. Um, that's just for your eyes only here. Um, that sort of stuff, as I said, we don't really show up to anyone. Um, it's just something that we wanted to kind of discuss with you guys. Um, and that's it. Just like to say thank you to everyone that has come along and stuck around. Um, I hope you've all kind of got an understanding of I guess my process when it comes to filmmaking. Um, and that kind of inspires you to kind of create your own process and, and go out there and make the sort of films that you guys want to create. So thanks again. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the show.